either bad about the world or good about the world. Uh, generally, at four o'clock in the afternoon at an old man bar is the perfect time for me to be drinking whiskey. I like to get, it's a drink that makes me philosophical. You know, it's not like party kind of thing. I want to, I want to sit down at an old man bar watching the dust bones floating in, the, in a fading light coming through the window, maybe you know, put some Tom Waits on the jukebox and well, there are put things in perspective. There are different kinds of old man bars in New York City at four o'clock in the afternoon. What kind of old man bar are you referring to? Uh, one where nobody recognizes me, and if they did, they're either too drunk or couldn't care less. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, you know, it's a, it's a luxury that I really enjoy. Like the old Mars bar or something, that kind of old man bar. Uh, yeah, or uh, let's see, uh, what's the one I like? The Macambo Lounge is a good one. Uh, there was one, there were a couple on 10, there was a dying uh, institution. Like uh, the old man bar, or like kind of dive bars in New York City? A, a, a genuine dive bar, you know, not, not a hipster sort of recreation of a dive bar. Uh, not, a post, not a post ironic dive bar, you know, a real dive bar. You know? <laughs> Come on in, we got cheese balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no TV. You know, a surly bartender, I think that's a must. Uh, if you order a drink with, you know, a cocktail with more than two components, you get a bit like, right. no. <laughs> Whiskey soda, that's it, man. Like, Jack and Coke, get out of here. You go to the old Siberia bar that was on the subway on uh, Broadway and 50th Street. And that's where you met the guy that uh, makes the soup, that right? The Siberia bar. Um, you know, I remember I went in with somebody, he ordered a screwdriver, and the, the, the bartender said, wait a minute, what? He said, you know, orange juice and vodka. Orange juice and vodka, together, in a glass. <laughs> Piss off, man. <laughs> so this is a serious drinking bar. You know, take that shit down the street. <laughs> In Scotland, they throw out if you ask for ice. <laughs> yeah, I know. I worry about this because I do. Uh, you know, maybe if it's a 30 year, uh, I'm gonna. I'm very aware of the fact that you know all eyes are on me. <laughs> but um, every once in a while, I will take one cube in, in a good, in a good scotch and a good whiskey. And I can almost hear the intake of breath from all the Spanish dudes I've been working with. Oh, you know, it was, uh... <laughs> It's, 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 it's hard if you're not used to whiskey neat. Even sometimes the best whiskey is neat. If you're not used to that, it can be it can be difficult for someone who's drinking it. I mean, I for one usually take ice in my whiskey, but this is smooth and, and beautiful. I yeah, don't it's, 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 not to, it's to open it up and, and let the flavor bloom in such a way as to expose it to more popples of the tongue simultaneously, thereby allowing you to enjoy it. And this would be my argument that gets the you know angry Scottish dudes coming at me over this issue. But I mean, some people actually suggest that, or just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of water. I want to go back to something that uh, I think was my first question for you about, and it goes back to being obsessed with things that are handcrafted, and people enjoying uh, nicer restaurants now that are a wider breadth of the culture enjoying nicer restaurants now. Do you think there is a movement, or at the very least, a sort of tide changing in the culture, away from sort of the boomer ideal of the microwave dinner and the very quick, cheap beer, to a sort of different culture that embraces things that may take a little longer, may cost a little more, but are overall better for your body, taste better, and the planet? Uh, uh, I think so. I mean, people think I just more... hopeful? No, no, I think um, certainly in the room we're sitting right now, and in many of the places that are probably comfortable to us, those things, we have the luxury of making those things a priority. Um, and of course, that, tri that point of view does trickle down uh, everywhere. Um, but yes, I think people think now, I mean, I've seen it in my career as a chef, people think now about where their food comes from, uh, how it was sourced, they know a lot more about the, the dishes put in front of them, they have higher expectations, uh, they have uh, the chef, uh, the cooks have become empowered uh, or elevated in status in such a way that we, we actually care about the opinion of the person who cooked the food. We see that as a valid, you know, uh, opinion worth worth the knowing. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I mean you, you see that at every level at the supermarket, uh, in restaurants. Um, and I think that's a, a, a good thing. Um, I think that's also due in part, not to commend you too much, but I think that's due in part to the rise of popularity of personalities like yourself, who have sort of built careers off of showcasing what can be done in a kitchen in different parts of the world, showcasing different parts of the world through food and now through, and now craftsmanship through this series as well. 
I don't know. I just think in many ways, you know, you have to credit people like Emerald 